This podcast contains descriptions of violence against children and adult language and is not suitable for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Suffer the Little Children, the true crime podcast giving voices back to the victims of child abuse and shining a harsh spotlight on the parents, guardians, and caretakers who silenced them. I'm your host, Lane, and this is episode 158, Christian Crossland. Christian Crossland spent most of his short life in the care of family friends, Brittany and Trevor Easton, who took Christian into their Indiana home and loved him like their own. In January of 2022, Christian's biological mother, Chelsea Crossland, took him back from the family who doted on and adored him. In under three months, Christian was dead. This is the story of a little boy with a bright smile and a personality to match. It's also the story of the woman who gave birth to him, let another family raise him, and then spent 74 days systematically starving and ultimately beating him to death. This is the tragic story of Christian Crossland. Just one quick patron shout-out today. Thank you so much, Malia N. from Vancouver, Washington, for your pledge. I appreciate you so much. To make a pledge, you can visit patreon.com slash stlcpod. I've been watching this case since I first learned about it last year, and now that the legal case is wrapped up, I thought it was time to share Christian's story with you. Christian Ray Crossland was born on July 12, 2016, in Muncie, Indiana, to 21-year-old Chelsea Crossland, who had two older daughters. According to a few news sources, Christian's father is a man named Nicholas Riddle, who was 24 when Christian was born. Later, I'll get into why I'm not entirely sure who Christian's biological father is. In 2018, for reasons I've been unable to determine, two-year-old Christian began living with Chelsea's friend, Brittany Ballinger, and her partner, Trevor Easton, both of whom lived with Brittany's mom, Rhonda Ballinger, along with Brittany's brother, Dustin Ballinger. The Ballinger family took Christian in and treated him like their own for over three years. He was a happy, outgoing little boy with blonde hair, blue eyes, and a beautiful smile. It appears that Chelsea moved back to her home state of Texas for a time around 2019, where she dated a guy or two before returning to Indiana by 2020. In August of 2020, Chelsea ran into some legal trouble in Indiana when she was charged with operating a vehicle with a blood alcohol content of 0.15 or more, which is more than twice the legal limit, operating a vehicle while intoxicated, leaving the scene of an accident, and resisting or fleeing law enforcement. After two days in jail, she was released on her own recognizance. While these were all misdemeanor crimes, Chelsea did undergo a one-day trial on July 29, 2021, during which a six-person jury found her guilty on all charges. Five days later, Chelsea was sentenced to two and a half years in the Jay County Security Center with all but 12 days suspended, which she was ordered to serve over five consecutive weekends starting immediately. She was given credit for two days' time served, and she was placed on probation. In November of 2020, Nick Riddle took out a protective order against Chelsea. However, it was dismissed on June 16, 2021, after authorities caught wind that Nick might be staying with Chelsea in direct violation of his own protective order. A search warrant for Chelsea's home at 689 Southwestern Avenue in Portland, Indiana, found Nick in the home. Chelsea spent two days in jail, and in October of 2021, she ultimately pleaded guilty to misdemeanor invasion of privacy in exchange for a six-month suspended sentence and additional probation. Nick's identical charge was dismissed. In November of 2021, Chelsea gave birth to another son. Shortly afterward, she apparently got the urge to take Christian back from the Ballingers as well. 
On January 8, 2022, Christian returned to his mother's care. In under three months, he would be gone. Around 11.30 p.m. on March 24, 2022, Chelsea Crossland called 911, telling the emergency dispatcher that her son had fallen and was unresponsive. Responding officers from the Portland Police Department found the home filthy and unkempt. On the floor of the upstairs bathroom, they discovered the body of five-year-old Christian Crossland, who was emaciated, dehydrated, and covered with bruises all over his body, as well as abrasions and other injuries to his face. He was wearing only a diaper. The Portland Police Department requested assistance from the Indiana State Police's Fort Wayne Post, whose investigators immediately took over the investigation, along with help from the Portland PD, the Jay County Prosecutor's Office, and the Indiana Department of Child Services. Sadly, five-year-old Christian Crossland was pronounced dead at the scene. When asked what happened, Chelsea told an acquaintance that while she was in the bathtub, Christian fell down the stairs. She later accused the acquaintance of lying about the part about Christian falling down the stairs. The day after Christian died, police and the Indiana Department of Child Services removed Chelsea's surviving children from her custody. On her since-deactivated Facebook page, at 6.54 p.m. on March 25, 2022, Chelsea posted, Prayers, please. They took my kids, even though they've seen for themselves they're great. They fought to go with police and DCS. They are traumatized, and so am I. Mommy loves you kids with everything in me. Y'all are my whole world, my reason for life. I never would have imagined our worlds getting turned upside down like this, but I'm praying everything turns out okay and we can all be back home together soon. Or at least, even if not, that y'all will be all together with family. God, please help me to stay strong for myself, but also for my babies to be together and stay strong too. I'm putting it in the Lord's hands too. I'm nothing without y'all, so I'm praying we are all home together soon. Based on that post alone, you'd never know that one of Chelsea's children was dead. In another post on March 26th, Chelsea wrote, My heart is broken into a million pieces. I just want my babies. An autopsy conducted in Fort Wayne, Indiana, revealed that Christian died from blunt force trauma to his head and mouth. The autopsy, which was attended by investigators from both the Portland Police Department and the Indiana State Police, found injuries consistent with a beating. The report also noted that Christian's malnourishment was so severe that he failed to thrive. On March 29, 2022, 27-year-old Chelsea Lynette Crossland was arrested and held in the Jay County Security Center on a bond of $100,000. She was preliminarily charged with neglect of a dependent resulting in death, accused of beating her malnourished son so brutally that he had no chance of survival. The following day, the Jay County prosecutor issued a press release saying it had filed formal charges against Chelsea. Felony charges of murder and neglect of a dependent resulting in death were related to Christian's death. A separate felony charge of child molesting was related to an incident involving Chelsea's nine-year-old daughter. The girl told police that Chelsea spanked, beat, and choked Christian with her hands and other objects until he lost consciousness. The girl said her mother didn't immediately call 911 when Christian became unconscious, and in fact, Chelsea talked out loud about how she could dispose of Christian's body. According to Christian's sister, their mother often punished the five-year-old by withholding food, sometimes for days at a time. The girl also told police that Chelsea molested her for about two years. When investigators interviewed Nick Riddle, Christian's father, He told them that in the past, Chelsea had told him she wished Christian was dead. A pair of local moms, Shelley Pfeiffer and Vivian Pryor, quickly organized a prayer vigil in Christian's memory on Friday, April 1st at Hudson Family Park in Portland. Shelley said, mother was publicly putting stuff on Facebook and didn't seem to care about the child. Does that make sense? Like, there was no remorse. Um, She had nothing to say about him. And that was very strange. As a mom, I think I would be absolutely heartbroken. Vivian said, It has really hit all of us um, very strongly. Another local mom said, That emotion inside of me is rage, anger, and so hurt over that child's death. 
The vigil took place on the first day of Child Abuse Awareness Month 2022. Amongst the approximately 50 attendees was Christian's dad, Nick, who gave a short speech about his son. Vivian also gave a speech, during which she said, I did not know Christian personally. However, I am a mother of a seven-year-old and a five-week-old. Both of them are boys. They are my whole entire world. I could not even begin to imagine living life without either one of them. When I heard the news about Christian, my heart was completely broken. I had so many questions. I went into my children's room and kissed both of them on the forehead with tears running down my face. That April, Chelsea's attorney, Jacob Dunnick of Muncie, who also represented her during her previous legal problems, filed a motion for a change of venue, saying that in Jay County, Chelsea was the target of public hostility and public outrage. Comments on her Facebook page, he wrote in the motion, were deeply bitter, incendiary in nature, and threaten hostility. He included printed screenshots of Chelsea's Facebook posts, as well as news articles written about the case. In mid-2022, Mr. Dunnock filed another motion with the court, this one to allow his client to pursue a defense of mental disease or defect. J. Circuit Judge Brian Hutchison appointed a psychiatrist, Dr. Craig Buckles, and a Delaware County psychologist, Dr. Bob Hatfield, to examine Chelsea and determine whether she was presently incompetent to stand trial and unable to appreciate the wrongfulness of her conduct. However, J. County Prosecutor Wesley Sheminar argued against the change of venue motion, saying, Serious criminal allegations are often covered by news outlets and discussed by various individuals on social media. Ultimately, Chelsea was found competent to stand trial, and her change of venue motion was denied. Her trial was scheduled to begin on September 26, 2022, but, like most trials, it was ultimately postponed. Chelsea's jury trial began on July 17, 2023, in Jay County Circuit Court. For her murder charge, she faced a sentence of 45 to 65 years, and each of her other two charges could earn her between 20 and 40 additional years. On day one of the trial, Chelsea's attorney renewed their request for a change of venue, but were, of course, denied. Also, her charge of child molesting was dismissed without prejudice, which means prosecutors can refile the charges if they choose to in the future. Testimony in the trial began on Tuesday, July 18, 2023. During opening arguments, Jake County Chief Deputy Prosecutor Zechariah Landers told the jury that evidence would prove Chelsea made the conscious decision to kill her son over the last few months of his life, during which she slowly starved him and beat him to death. He told the jury members that they would see evidence of Christian's malnourishment, dehydration, and multiple injuries all over his body. They would hear from multiple witnesses, see some terrible photos, watch police body cam footage, and hear Chelsea's eerily calm 911 call. He also mentioned a comment Chelsea made to officers who responded to her son's death scene. Unbelievably, she said, So, I'm guessing this is going to take a while? In the defense's opening argument, Jay County Chief Public Defender Brandon Murphy told the jury that Christian was, indeed, neglected, but Chelsea did not intentionally kill him. He said, The evidence in this case will show Christian had a short and tragic life. In the final days of his life, he desperately needed medical care. He claimed that Christian was sick for several days, but Chelsea, who he called a non-vaccination mother, did not believe in taking her children to doctors. He also claimed that Chelsea wasn't the only person who had contact with her son during his final days and that she tried to feed him before he died. The worst part about this case is about how preventable this all was. Witness testimony also began Tuesday, during which Chelsea mostly kept her head down, apparently taking notes. During testimony from Indiana State Police crime scene investigator James Stevens, the prosecution displayed photos of the crime scene, which showed a refrigerator, freezer, and pantry fully stocked with food. They also displayed photos of Christian's body on the scene. He lay flat on the ground, wearing only a diaper, although he was previously potty trained. They showed a photo of Christian's face, described by the commercial review as pale white, with a skeletal outline of his nose, dark eyes, and hair stringing out from his head in all directions as well as a notable mark on the side of his head. At this photo, two women in the courtroom began to sob, covering their mouths. 
Two officers from the Portland Police Department also testified the same day. When they responded to Chelsea's 911 call, they said they saw Christian's body lying in the upstairs bathroom. Officer Fields described the bruised and battered little boy as very skinny. Both officers testified that Chelsea did not cry while they were on the scene, and Officer Wright said that Chelsea's demeanor was calm. Prosecutors played the recording of the 911 call, during which Chelsea told the dispatcher that she gave Christian a bath and he fell while getting out of the tub. She repeatedly said, I tried everything I could, her voice seeming to crack a few times, and she told the dispatcher that it had been about an hour and a half since Christian took his last breath. In police body cam footage, Chelsea tried to explain what happened, saying, It was out of nowhere. Shortly after that, police taped off the house's front door while a child sobbed off screen. Former paramedic and now J Emergency Medical Service Director Kyle Gerlock, who also responded to the scene, previously gave a video deposition in which he described a very emaciated child dead on the bathroom floor. Mr. Gerlock said there was blood around Christian's face, which was cyanotic or blue from lack of oxygen. The boy had very little meat on his bones, which the paramedic could see through Christian's skin. Mr. Gerlock's deposition backed up the police officer's testimony that Chelsea seemed calm and detached on the scene. He recalled that Chelsea told him she tried performing CPR on her son for about 30 minutes before calling 911. When he had her sign an EMS form, he said, she signed it with her first name and a smiley face. Also on the stand Tuesday were Chelsea's friend and Christian's foster mother, Brittany Easton, and Brittany's mother, Rhonda Ballinger. Rhonda testified that while Christian lived with them, he never seemed sick and had a healthy appetite. She said he liked food. When she and Brittany went to Chelsea's house for a birthday party about a week before Christian died, they didn't see him. Chelsea told Rhonda that Christian wasn't at the party because he was misbehaving. On cross-examination, defense attorney Murphy asked Rhonda if Brittany's husband, Trevor, had ever been in a relationship with Chelsea. Rhonda said she had heard the gossip but never witnessed any evidence of such a relationship. I think it's worth mentioning here that on Trevor's Facebook page, in the comments on a photo of him and Christian sharing some ice cream and wearing each other's hats, Trevor wrote, He was the best son and my best friend. I couldn't have asked for anything else. A friend commented, Is he the only child you had with her? Trevor responded, I only had Christian with her, but I treated all the kids like they were mine. He refers to Christian as his son in other posts as well, and a friend commented on one post that she was sad Christian's mother was mentioned in the obituary while Trevor was not. From Trevor's comments, it sounds as if he's claiming to be Christian's biological father, but I can't be sure. Brittany testified that she was present during one incident in which Chelsea scolded Christian for taking food out of the fridge without her express permission. Another time, Brittany said, Christian got his clothes dirty and Chelsea punished him by cleaning him up in a cold shower. When an attorney asked how she knew the water was cold, Brittany said, Because I could hear him crying. She said that you gotta learn. Brittany also testified about a phone call Rhonda received from Chelsea, which Rhonda put on speakerphone. Brittany heard Chelsea say, Please pray for me. I did something bad. Don't tell the police. On Tuesday afternoon, the jury heard from Indiana State Police Detective Matthew Teusch, who described responding to the house on Southwestern Street in Portland when he was informed about a deceased child with suspicious circumstances. The detective also interviewed Chelsea, video footage of which was shown in court. During the interview, the detective repeatedly told Chelsea she was free to leave at any time. Chelsea told him that she worked as a certified nurse's assistant, or CNA. She seemed hesitant to tell the detective certain details about her other kids, saying they were absolutely okay. The detective recalled seeing both of Chelsea's daughters, who he said appeared fine and well-nourished. When Detective Teusch later served a search warrant at Chelsea's home, he found a black and blue notebook with the words, I hate Trevor, written on it, apparently referring to Brittany Easton's husband. The detective also found a checkered blanket that smelled like urine and a trash bag that one of Christian's sisters said their mom put their baby brother into after he died. 
Both girls also testified on Tuesday. Chelsea's younger daughter, by then eight years old, testified that when her mother was asleep, she would sneak food to her baby brother. The older girl, now ten, testified that their mother asked her what to do with Christian's body. Chelsea then took out a trash bag to put her son's body into. Both girls testified, and this was backed up by text messages from Chelsea, that Christian ate his own feces. The final prosecution witness on Wednesday was child abuse pediatrician Tara Holleran of Riley Hospital in Indianapolis, who told jurors that over the last two months of his life, Christian took in nearly zero calories per day. The defense took about two hours to present its case. Nick Riddle testified about seeing his son a few weeks before his death, at which time he described Christian as happy and smiley. Chelsea's mother, Gladys Lynette Crossland, testified in her daughter's defense, saying that she saw her grandson on her birthday on February 8, 2022. She said he looked normal that day. Gladys also testified about the day of Christian's death, March 24, 2022, saying it took her an hour and a half to get to Chelsea's home because she didn't have a car and lived in Albany. Prosecutor Landers showed her a photo of Christian after he died. Gladys began to sob and said, That's not what I saw. He didn't look like that. The prosecutor also asked if Gladys learned about what other witnesses had testified about during the trial during a phone call on Tuesday from her daughter, which Gladys admitted was true. Because this was a violation of the court's separation of witnesses order, Gladys was dismissed, leaving the courtroom in tears. Chelsea opted not to testify in her own defense. Both sides rested their cases on Wednesday and gave their closing arguments on Thursday morning. In his closing argument, Jay County Prosecutor Wes Sheminar talked about being called to Christian's death scene by police the night of his death. That image of him has never left my mind. It's never probably going to leave my mind. It's never probably going to leave yours. What do you say about a case like this? 74 days is what keeps coming back to me. 74 days is how long it takes to starve a five-year-old boy. Every second of every hour for 74 days, she made a conscious decision not to feed her son. How could anybody, let alone his own mother, inflict horror on a little child? This was a horrific way to kill somebody. It took 74 days of methodically sticking to the program of not feeding Christian and beating him. We treat animals better than she treated Christian. During his closing argument, defense attorney Brandon Murphy argued that the prosecution hadn't proven murder, which is defined in Indiana as the intentional killing of a human being. Mr. Murphy argued, Murder requires an act. The charge of neglect resulting in death, defined as knowingly or intentionally placing a dependent in a situation that endangers their life or health, resulting in death or catastrophic injury, was much more realistic, he said. He said that Christian's death could have been prevented with treatment, adding, That's neglect, not murder. Mr. Murphy mentioned that just a few months before Christian died, Chelsea gave birth to another son, indicating she suffered from postpartum depression. He also tried to lay blame on Chelsea's family and friends, who he said had been around Christian and done nothing to save him. Not one of them picked up the phone to call CPS. His death was preventable. It took one phone call from somebody else who cared. Mr. Sheminar responded to Mr. Murphy's closing argument, telling the jury that the public defender had a unique view on the case. In the prosecutor's opinion, the act of murder was Chelsea's withholding food and beating her son. Adopting Murphy's logic, if I really don't like you, really want to see you dead, all I have to do is lock you in a cage and not feed you for a few days. After the closing arguments, Judge Brian Hutchison turned the case over to the jury, who took just over an hour to reach its verdict. On both charges, murder and neglect of a dependent resulting in death, the jury found Chelsea Crossland guilty. After the verdict, phase two of the trial began immediately, during which jurors would consider their recommended sentence for Chelsea after hearing from more witnesses who testified the same day. Prosecutor Sheminar called to the stand Jay County Coroner Michael Brewster, as well as recalling Dr. Holleran. On the stand, Dr. Holleran described the difference between child torture and child abuse, saying that for treatment to be defined as torture, the caretaker must have made at least two physical assaults against the child, or one prolonged assault resulting in distress and there must also be at least two elements of psychological abuse, such as isolation and deprivation. When asked about injuries found on Christian's neck and ear, 
Dr. Holleran testified that he couldn't have sustained them from falling or playing roughly. While telling the jury about the aggravated circumstances that must be present to sentence someone to life without parole in Indiana, the prosecutor mentioned Christian's age and the torture Chelsea forced him to endure, calling the last few months of Christian's life a prolonged 74-day horror show. Defense attorney Dunnock called Gladys Crossland again, who described Chelsea's upbringing in Texas and said the family moved to Jay County, Indiana in 2012. Gladys said that Chelsea's father, Randy, was in prison for most of Chelsea's life on repeated burglary convictions. Gladys also testified that Randy suffered from anxiety and schizophrenia and that she and Chelsea also had mental health issues. Gladys testified that Chelsea had previously mentioned wanting to harm or kill herself. Gladys also confirmed that all of Chelsea's boyfriends throughout her life had abused, beaten, and strangled her. Mr. Dunnock mentioned mitigating factors to the jury, including Chelsea's mental health, family history, limited resources, and minimal criminal history, in which she had never been convicted of more than a misdemeanor crime. He insisted that justice was already served for Christian with the two guilty verdicts. I just ask that you put the brakes on a little bit with this phase. Don't dismiss the mitigating factors. Justice was served. The jury came back with a sentencing recommendation of life in prison without parole, and Chelsea's sentencing hearing was scheduled to take place on Thursday, August 24, 2023. At the sentencing hearing, Trevor Easton's sister, Christina Easton, spoke pointing out a number of family members and friends in the courtroom who came to the hearing in support of Christian. She thanked the prosecution team for getting justice for Christian, adding, We just wanted to say how much we loved him and how big of a hole it's going to be in our family without him. At the hearing, defense attorney Murphy asked Judge Hutchison to consider a sentence of 55 years, which is the advisory sentence for murder in Indiana. An advisory sentence is basically a guideline the court can consider voluntarily. Indiana law reads, If the jury reaches a sentencing recommendation, the court shall sentence the defendant accordingly. While sentencing Chelsea to the recommended term of life in prison without parole, Judge Hutchison said, I understand I'm bound by the jury. Even if I'm not, I think life without parole is a very appropriate sentence. Noting the severity of the case, the judge said, There are people out there who hope you get the same treatment as Christian. I would rather the scales fall from your eyes and you live the remainder of your years in horror. However, he said, there was nothing about Chelsea's demeanor that made him believe she would ever feel remorse. After the trial, Prosecutor Sheminar said, What can I say? It was probably the most difficult case I've ever had the displeasure of being a part of. I think the jury reached the right outcome in this case. Chelsea Lynette Crossland, now aged 28, is serving her life sentence at the Rockville Correctional Facility, where she may rub elbows with another child killer I've discussed in the past, Diana Medina Flores, who is serving a 65-year prison term for the murder of her 12-year-old stepson, Eduardo Paso. I told Eduardo's story in episode 15 of this podcast and in multiple update episodes since. Chelsea's father, Randy Crossland, is back in prison in Texas. He pleaded guilty in May of 2023 to two felony counts of assaulting a peace officer and was sentenced to 30 years in prison. He will be eligible for parole after serving a quarter of his sentence, or just over seven years. As for Trevor Easton, it appears that Chelsea initially tried to frame him for Christian's murder. Her father, Randy, made comments on Trevor's Facebook page about wanting to talk to Trevor, man to man, because I know what the fuck happened. Another Facebook user posted a video of Randy arguing on the phone with a couple, during which Randy said, Listen, dude, listen. It was Trevor Dallas, Trevor Easton, the fucking sex offender that was over there that did that shit. Another man, Frank Holland, commented on one of Chelsea's posts shortly after Christian's death. There's an innocent mother in jail right now for something she had no part of. Trevor, a known sex offender, is the guilty party, and they're looking for his ass now. He is the one who did the molesting. I believe all of this took place before it was announced that Chelsea's molestation charge involved her older daughter, not Christian. Still, as it turns out, 30-year-old Trevor Dallas Easton is on the Indiana Sex and Violent Offender Registry. 
In 2014, at age 21, he pleaded guilty to sexual misconduct with a minor, intercourse or deviant sex by an 18-year-old or older with a child 14 or younger. I couldn't find any information on who his victim was. For that crime, Trevor was given a suspended sentence of two years and will be on the registry until March of 2025. Since I know nothing about the situation that landed Trevor on the list, all I can say is that it truly appears that Brittany, Trevor, and their families adored Christian, doted on him, and surrounded him with all the love and happiness he deserved. I reached out to a few members of the Ballinger and Easton family, but I wasn't able to connect with any of them. In my opinion, they should be considered Christian's real family. The vast majority of photos I was able to find of Christian were pictures of Christian with Trevor, Rhonda, Brittany, her best friend Amy, and Brittany's brother, Dustin. If not for the Ballingers, all we would have is a single photo of Christian wearing a red and black beanie with glow sticks in his hat and around his neck, which was the single photo provided in his obituary and which every news source used from then on. I'm so grateful that the Ballingers documented Christian's happiness through those photos and gave him the life and the love he deserved. Trevor created a memorial walkway for Christian outside the family's house in Newcastle, consisting of white stone, a tiny bench, a few other ornamental pieces, and lots of toy trucks. While I don't have a ton of information about who Christian was as a person, I can tell you a little bit. Christian Ray Crossland liked monster trucks, John Deere tractors, Paw Patrol, and fishing. His Aunt Christina wrote about him, Many think this awful world he lived in for three months was his whole life. It wasn't. Christian was loved by many and spoiled rotten at times. His smile could be seen from a mile away, as well as his strength. I'll never forget those memories we all have with him and will forever keep his name and memory alive with us all. Until we meet again, sweet boy. Rest in peace, Christian. You will forever be loved. My sources for this episode were the Williamson, Spencer, and Penrod Funeral Home website, the Mercer County Outlook, 21 Alive News, WANE, WRTV Indianapolis, the Star Press, the Commercial Review, Facebook, Indiana's My Case Portal, the Indiana Sex and Violent Offender Registry, the Texas Department of Criminal Justice website, and the Indiana Department of Corrections website. That's it for this week. Join me next time for another episode. If you like the show, please follow or subscribe to Suffer the Little Children on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, Spreaker, Pandora, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast listening app. And please leave me a five-star rating and a positive review on your favorite podcast platform. Visit the website at SufferTheLittleChildrenPod.com. You can support the show by visiting patreon.com slash stlcpod, where you can become a patron for rewards ranging from a shout-out by name on the show to bonus content and exclusive gifts. You can also support the show at ko-fi.com slash stlcpod. Follow the podcast on Facebook and Instagram at Suffer the Little Children Pod, and on TikTok at stlcpod. View photos related to today's episode on Facebook. For more stories like the one you heard today, visit SufferTheLittleChildrenBlog.com. This podcast is researched, written, hosted, edited, and produced by Lane. Intro theme music is by DreamNote Music, and all music for the show is licensed from AudioJungle.net. For more information about preventing or reporting child abuse, visit ChildHelp.org or call your area's child abuse hotline. And remember, if you see something, say something.